Hello, and welcome back to Living Pages. Tonight, we have two stories by two different authors. First, we have The Haunted Author by Marcus Clark. What can I do you for, sir? I asked, blandly astonished. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man in a rough pea jacket and scowled portentously. Put me into an honest livelihood, he answered. It was such a strange demand that I could only stare. Don't you understand me? He said, seating himself with rough vehemence. I want to become a reputable member of society. I want some honest employment. But, my good sir, why do you come to me? Your motive is, is most excellent, but an honest employment is the last thing at, at my disposal. That be blowed, said he. You could give me a fortune if you liked. You know you could. But I don't want that. No, I'm fly to that game. You'll have some blessed elder brother that nobody knowed of coming back from New Zealand and succeeding to the ancestral mansion. Or you'll get me pitched out of my gilded chariot at the church door and marry my wife that ought to be to somebody else. I know you. I only want a modest competence. Nobody, nobody interferes with that. Your language is even more mysterious than your appearance, my friend, I said. Ha! said he. I never heard a man out of books say, ha! Never. Don't you know me? I looked at him steadily, and it seemed that I ought to know him. That hat, that pea jacket, that knotted scarf around his muscular throat, those brown, sinewy hands, those fierce eyes, all were familiar to me. That bundle and that stick, had I not seen them a hundred times in the admirable drawings of Gilbert, Julian Porch, Cousins, Carrington, and Calvert? You don't happen to have any marks about you, I asked with a cold sweat broke out upon my brow. He laughed, that bitter laugh which I had described so often. I have a peculiar mole on the back of my neck. The tip of my left ear is shot away, and my right side still bears the mark of Pompey's claws when he defended his young mistress Alice in the lonely swamp. I have lost the little finger of my right hand and have three pear-shaped wens beside the usual allowance of strawberry marks. There was no mistaking him. It was my villain. I knew his bloodthirsty nature and dreaded the tremendous struggle which experience told me was to follow. But why come here? I urged. I am sick of it, my villain said doggedly. I ain't to be badgered any more. It ain't a respectable business. First, I was Jabez Jamarack. Then, Black Will the Smuggler. Then, Ker Lewis Carleon, then a poacher, then a burglar, then an unjust steward, and now I'm an escaped convict. It was true. The unhappy creature before me had figured, in my world-round novels, in all of those capacities. It's getting a little too rough on me, continued my villain. I ain't a bad sort, at least I wasn't, when you took me from my peaceful home in the old Kentish Valley. And I say I'm getting sick of this line of business. I've a conscience, Mr. Clark, though you don't give me credit for it. 
unless it's seared, and I'm not going to be plunged into the black abyss of crime no longer. How many poor young maidens haven't I carried off? How many unsuspecting barrow knights haven't I pushed over the towering cliff? How many policemen haven't I knocked on the head? How many custom house officers, cussing and swearing tremendous the while, haven't I buried in the foaming billow? How many children haven't I kidnapped? How many wives haven't I married? and disposed of afterwards in various ways. My eyes, what a beauty I've been, haven't I? It was true. He had done, by my direction, all these things. It ain't my personal appearance, continued the miserable man, though what with warts and moles and strawberry marks and ain't much to boast of. It ain't on account of wounds with axes and bullets and such like that I cares. It ain't because I'm all out nights and all sorts of weathers, mostly thunderous. It ain't because I'm often drunk, always in debt, and totally disreputable. It ain't because I've murdered a large variety of mothers and brought the gray heirs of a corresponding number of aged fathers with sorrow to the grave. It ain't because my language is altogether ridiculous, and I leave out more H's and put in more oaths in my conversation than any natural man did yet. It ain't that. No, he cried, waxing wroth. It's because I'm always left at the end of the third volume, if I'm alive, without hope of mercy or promise of repentance. I shuddered. Take some brandy. I said, and pushed him the decanter. He took it and, filling half a tumbler with neat spirit, drained it at a gulp. I knew he would. The beast, under my direction, invariably took his liquor in that fashion. I appeal to you, if that's fair. Is it right? Is it just? Governor, your young curate always gets the gal he's after. Your comic servant winds up with the chambermaid, your aristocratic villain, the Marquis, my master, who poisons his niece and shoots his aunt with an air gun. He's all right. He disports himself in the gilt and splendid salongs of Perry, he does. He drives four in hand down the boulevards, and Mary is the lovely and accomplished Duchess of Double Gloucester. If he does get found out, he blows out his brains in the true style of the old regime. He never hung in chains, or tucked to Newgate, or starved to death in a deserted drive on the diggings of Bendigo. What can you do? I asked terrified at the vehemence of this strange man. Do? Again, that harsh and grating laugh at which so many hapless maidens have trembled. I wish I had made it a little sweeter. What can't I do? Haven't you left me hanging by my hands from a bough suspended for a whole month over an awful precipice? Haven't I raised trees with my mighty muscles and burst open doors with kicks of my ponderous boots? I can do anything. But why waste words? Are we not alone here? No sound but the whistling of the wind in the wide chimney of the moated grange. No footstep but that of the midnight mouser as she creeps stealthily to her prey. Ha! Thou art mine, and... Ha ha, indeed. I guessed how it would happen. My experience as a novel writer told me as such. Just as the enraged ruffian advanced to seize me, Leonard Fairfield, 
my pious hero, who had been waiting in the passage of the priory since his return from sea, bounded into the room and caught my assailant by the throat. This villain in thy teeth, he cried. How often had he cried thus, and pinioned him. It might be thought that I stayed to lend assistance. Not I. I knew better what was required of me. With a shriek of terror, I fled out of the open door and sped along the lonely road with the speed of a hunted stag. Black Jack and Marin Hafaz were consulting in the thieves' kitchen when I entered. I knew the cunning nature of the latter and felt that the thousand-pound note I held between my fingers would purchase the secret of the potion. I showed it to him, and he laughed satirically. That is some <laughs> flat man the forger's work, he said. Why, did you not kill him in your last chapter? Ass that I was, I had allowed the maimed and mangled wretch to live, and this was how he repaid me. Outside came the hurried tramp of feet. They were on my track. Save me, Blackjack, I exclaimed wildly. Remember, remember when you were fast locked in Newgate without hope of mercy? I took you out by a subterranean passage never before known to exist and gave you the hand of the fair Belinda. Aye, but only to recapture me in the next chapter, replied Blackjack with a grin of scorn. I've not forgotten the ducking you gave me at the lonely mill. No. Let them tear you limb from limb. I care not. My position was evidently desperate when a newcomer appeared upon the scene. By his wavy hair, square-toed wellingtons, massive watch chain, and handkerchief that hung from the right-hand pocket of his shooting coat, I knew him at once. He was Sir Aubrey de Briancourt. Assist me! I exclaimed. The look of scorn he gave was sufficient to daunt a bolder man. But I knew of a spell by which I could compel him. Hist! I said in a thrilling whisper. Proud scion of a lordly house. There is another, Sir Aubrey. Refuse to aid me, and young Fairfield shall assume thy name and title. These minions are beyond my power, but remember, you are to be continued in our next. The threat made pale the cheek even of one whose ancestors had bled on Bosworth, and the baronet waved a white hand towards the back door. Take my cabriolet, dog, he said with that courtesy which characterizes the British aristocrat. At that instant, the rough voice of the villain was heard at the gate. I need scarcely remark that I leapt into the cabriolet with what was soon driving the rapidity of lightning towards Goodman's gully. Fast behind came the echo of hooves. The lightning flashed incessantly, and the man who held the reins was white with fear. All at once, a man clad in a red shirt jumped from behind a bush and seized the head of the mare. Who are you? I cried. The most abused of all, said he. I am the typical digger. I am the man whom you and others of your tribe have made eat bank notes as sandwiches. I have shod my horse with gold and swilled champagne, which I detest, out of stable buckets. Frank Fowler has maligned me. Orion Home has sneered at me, Kingsley has mocked me, Howitt has slandered me, Thatcher has made ballads on me. 
Do we think a man is never to change his shirt? Why should I always be compelled to appear in this sanguinary garment? Am I to pass my life in finding repeatedly gigantic nuggets and being perpetually robbed to the same? Am I to be forever considered such an ass as to give handfuls of gold dust for a glass of brandy? Must I never shave? Shall the tyranny of the fiction monger compel me to sleep in boots? Calm yourself, my friend. I said. There is not much harm done. I know of some poor fellows whom the fiction mongers have treated much more rudely. At that instant, the demoniac howls of my pursuers were borne upon the blast. That may be, roared the digger of romance, but I will be avenged on thee. Come. The cabriolet disappeared in the distance. There was never a cabriolet yet that did not do such under some circumstances. And my captor led me away. He paused at the door of the usual bush inn, how well I knew it, and striking three loud blows upon the door, they invariably struck three loud blows, We were admitted into a long apartment. I beheld with astonishment that all the personages whom I had imagined the creatures of my own too fertile brain were there. Wretch! cried the fair Madeline. Why did you not unite me to the Duke? You know you only changed your mind at the last moment. Monster! said the lovely Violet. You made me pass three nights of horror in the Red Farm, when one stroke of your pen would have freed me. Miserable man, cried Jabaz Jemarak, the blood of the Earl be upon your head. You knew that I had no intention of killing his lordship until the base lack of a sensation for your last chapter impelled me to the bloody deed. And I, remarked Henry Mortimer, with that cynical smile that I had so often depicted, curling his proud lip, did I wish to throw my elder brother down a well in order to succeed to his name and heritage? No. I loved him fondly, madly, as you took pains to state in your earlier chapters. I should have loved him still, had not Cora the Gypsy wound her spells about my heart. Who brought her to me? Did I, of my own accord, I, a proud scion of Britain's aristocracy, demean myself to such a love? No minion, twas thy brain contrived the meeting, thy hand that hurled my elder brother into the abyss and stamped the brand of Cain upon my brow. Away with him, hissed Lady Millicent, the poisoner. I knew not of the deadly power of Strike Nine until he told me. A lovely child. I roamed the lordly gardens of my father's princely mansion and chased the butterfly from flower to flower. T'was he that set on the smugglers to see me, and under his vile tuition I acquired in ten short chapters all the hideous knowledge of the bourgeois. Away with him! T'was he dishonored my bills cried Lord Augustus Plantagenet. "'Twas he that let me linger in consumption for forty pages folio, cried Coralie de Bellis, the planter's daughter. "'Twas he that blighted my voluptuous contours with an entirely unnecessary railway accident, wept the lovely Geraldine. "'Away with him!' "'Mercy!' 
I cried, gazing in terror on their well-known lineaments. Mercy! Mercy! cried the lost heiress Isabel Buminor. When for two long hours you deliberated whether my sainted mother or the poacher's wife should give me birth. Mercy for thee! Oh, no, no, no! It was terrible to hear my own impassioned language thus turned against me. Ladies and gentlemen, cried I in despair, consider the exigencies of fiction. Fiction be blowed, roared the digger. This way, boys! A deserted drive was before me. How many luckless wretches had I not thrown down it? And I made one supreme effort. Ladies and gentlemen, I shouted, consider dramatic unity. You could not all be happy. Dramatic unity be damned, snarled Jabez Jemrak. That is the last thing you thought of. I trembled over the abyss. Hold, said the rough voice of my villain, who had now approached. Make me respectable and you shall live. I can't, I said faintly. It is impossible. You are too great a ruffian. Let go, cried the digger and I already felt myself launched into the chasm when a loud ringing sounded in my ears, and I heard the voice of Leonard Fairfield. The noble fellow had sprung the alarm bell. "'Friends!' he shouted with all the force of his lungs. "'Ha <laughs> ha! "'Twas that I gave them to him. "'Thou art baffled, black demon!' Thy limbs shall feed the ravens, and the magpie perch upon thy fleshless skull. What ho! Without there! Why seek to dispel my ennui with this espeligery, mon ami? said the soft tones of the Count in his native tongue. Sacre, let the pauvre petit escape, my déjeuner. A lay for Chet awaits. The coup d'oeuvre is superb. The two ensemble all that could be desired. Voila. The digger swung me over the yawning grave. All the buttons in my waistcoat gave way, and for an instant, my life hung literally by a thread. Will you make me respectable? said the villain. Never. The button cracked. I was going, going, gone. When the alarm bell sounded, the door was burst open and Bridget entered. It is the boy from the printers for the proofs, said she. Tell him to wait, said I, and wiping the sweat from my intellectual brow, I seized my pen, and in ten lines had got my villain comfortably in irons at Norfolk Island. Next, we have The Cats of Ulthar by H.P. Lovecraft. It is said that in Ulthar, which lies beyond the river sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe, as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic, and close to strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus, and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Moreau and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords, and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin, and he speaks her language. But he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that 
which she hath forgotten. In Othar, before ever the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife, who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbors. Why they did this, I know not. Save that many hate the voice of the cat in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily about yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near their hovel. And from some of the sounds heard after dark, many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under spreading oaks at the back of a neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of the cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more. And instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mouser should stray toward the remote hovel under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed, the sounds heard after dark, the loser would lament impotently, or console himself by thanking fate that it was not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulthar were simple, and knew not whence it uh, and knew not whence it is all cats first came. One day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobbled streets of Ulthar. Dark wanderers they were, and unlike the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year. In the marketplace, they sold fortunes and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers, none could tell. But it was seen that they were given to strange prayers, and that they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There was in this singular caravan a little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy whom the dark people called Menes smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulthar, Menes could not find his kitten. And as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of the sounds heard in the night. And when he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation, and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms toward the sun, and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand. Though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy, nebulous figures of exotic things of hybrid creatures crowned with horned, flanked disks. 
Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night, the wanderers left Ulthar and were never seen again. And the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village, there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth, the familiar cat had vanished. Cats, large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white. Old Kernan, the burgomaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menes's kitten and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple, even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulthar in that accursed yard under the pines, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in some performance of unheard of right of beasts. The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy, and though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cats to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So Ulthar went to sleep in vain anger, and when the people awaked at dawn, behold, every cat was back at his accustomed hearth, large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair, and marveled not a little. Old Cronan again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them since cats did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their saucers of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days, the sleek, lazy cats of Ulthar would touch no food but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It was fully a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nith remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgomaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strangely silent dwelling as a matter of duty. Though in doing so, he was careful to take with him Shang, the blacksmith, and Thul, the cutter of stone, as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this. Two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the Burgesses of Ulthar. Zath, the coroner, disputed at length with Nith, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Thol were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweet meat as a reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small Menes and his black kitten, of the prayer of Menes and of the sky during the prayer, 
of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by traitors in Hatheg and discussed by travelers in Nur. Namely, that in Ulthar, no man may kill a cat. Thank you for joining me tonight for this episode of Living Pages. I hope to see you soon. Stay safe out there.